Well, good morning, or afternoon, whenever you happen to be watching this. Um, if you brought your Bibles, go ahead and get them out. Turn them on if they're electronic. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14 uh, today, Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 12. Uh, and at the end of uh, the sermon, we are also going to be celebrating communion. Uh, so if you haven't yet, you're going to need to find uh, some bread or some juice or anything that represents uh, or similar to that. Um, I think I've, I've done communion with goldfish and Gatorade. So whatever happens to be around you that, that you have or in your cupboard, you don't need any special bread or any special, special juice. But that'll be kind of at the end of, of uh, our, our time together today. But I love fancy meals. The ones that have so many forks that you don't know which one to use and when. Um, they serve the food in, in a particular order. And, and what I've noticed about that is it's usually from the healthiest to the least healthiest, where they start you with, with greens and then you end up with cheesecake. Um, but they, they match kind of the complete dinner to satisfy every taste bud that you have. And a good, big dinner is, is hard to beat. And today we're going to look at and see Jesus walk his disciples through what's called the Passover meal. Um, and it's one of those meals that, that's big and, and has a specific order to things. And, and, uh, but when you and I think of a big, tasty dinner, we think of good food. And there was certainly good food served at the Passover but there was also some weird food, salt water, some bitter herbs, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit, but not, not something that you and I would traditionally have at a big dinner. But those things had a purpose. Much like uh, the forks have a purpose at, at dinner, the, the, what was contained within the Passover meal was very specific and, and had a purpose behind it. And during this meal, Jesus is actually going to throw his disciples some curveballs, throw some surprises in there. And at the end, we're going to be left with what we traditionally call the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. But I want to propose to you that, that what we're going to talk about today is actually the First Supper. And in order to, to, to understand that, we're going to need to, to get to some of the Jewish roots of this ritual in order to understand the magnitude of what Christ did. So let's, let's read today's passage. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 12. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room? Where can I eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city, found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here, eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one? Jesus replied, It is one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die, just as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, and he broke it in pieces and gave to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it, and he said to them, This is my body, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. So this particular meal, the Passover meal, there was a lot of different ingredients that went along with it. Of course, you have the lamb, which is the Passover sacrifice. And, and here in a little bit, we're going to talk about some of the procedures uh, for what would happen with that. But they also served unleavened bread, and that represented the rapid exodus from Egypt. They were commanded in, in Exodus 12 to have, have bread without leaven because it takes a while for, for the bread to rise and then cook it and all that. But without that, it, it's a much quicker procedure. And, and they were going to be exiting 
leaving, they were going to be leaving Egypt quickly. So their bread had to be unleavened. And then uh, during Passover, they would actually eat unleavened bread for seven days, just as a reminder of that quick exit from Egypt. They, they, there was also salt water that was served at this. And it, it was a reminder that, that when they were in bondage in Egypt, that they would cry. And so salt water represented the tears of bondage in Israel. And then they would also serve some bitter herbs and they had some sauces that went along with it. But the bitter herbs was just a reminder that they were in slavery in Egypt. So this whole Passover meal, all of the ingredients were designed to remind them of what was going on in Egypt and how the Lord delivered them from that and sent them to the promised land. So there was a lot of, 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 of imagery. There was a lot of symbols in this particular meal. And there was also several rounds of wine, several glasses of wine. Several times they would drink wine during this. And, and we're going to look at each one of those. But the, the wine specifically, I want to turn to Exodus chapter 6, starting in verse 6. And, and, and they, had three to, they had four different type, times they would drink wine. And it was to remember different portions of, of Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It says this, therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression, will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. And then verse seven, I will claim you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. So each one of these cups, the first one that they would drink was, was rescuing from Egypt. And then the second cup reminded them as freedom from slavery. And the third one that, that Jesus, we believe, used um, uh, to, to draw his attention to his body and his, and his, and his blood was the, the cup that was to, to remind them of the redemption by God's power. It was a cup of thanksgiving. And then the fourth cup, the one that, that Jesus said he was not going to partake of, was the, the, the one talked about here in verse 7, the renewed relationship with God. And so Jesus says, I'm not going to drink that until the end. We're going to, it's just some amazing power in there. But in all of this, in today's passage, we see Jesus transform a 1,500-year-old tradition into something new. And this new tradition, this first supper, has lasted 2,000 years, and it's going to last until the end of time, until Christ returns. So we see in verses 12 to 17, preparing for the Last Supper. Verse 12, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? A lot of tradition here. They, they had to obtain very specific foods and prepare them in specific ways. And they had to eat them in a very specific location. In this case, it had to be inside Jerusalem. During Jesus' final week, he would often go into Jerusalem, do some preaching, some teaching, get in some arguments with people, uh, and then he would leave and retreat to Bethany. But this particular night, he stayed in Jerusalem. And the reason being, the Passover lamb that was sacrificed had to be consumed within the city limits. There was also a specific timetable. The, the Passover had to be eaten after sundown and before midnight. So, so his disciples went ahead of him in, into Jerusalem to prepare the meal for him. And then in verse 13 and, and 14, there's kind of this clandestine secret meeting, right? Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? There's no names exchanged. The fact that a man was, was carrying water was unusual. That was often the women's responsibility. And if a man happened to be carrying water, it was in a wine skin and not a jar. And then the disciples went up to him, hey, the teacher wants to know about this room. Right, you see, and, and there's been a lot of theories as to, to why the secret meeting and why it had to go this way. And, and of course, the sovereignty of God, Jesus knew when this man was going to be walking, who it was, where he was going. And, and some people believe he had a prearranged kind of meeting with him because the room was already prepared for Jesus. But I think there's more to it than that because, remember, Judas has already betrayed Jesus. He was looking for an opportune time to turn him over to, to the authorities. And the two people that went were, were Peter and John. It wasn't Judas. So Judas had no idea where this meeting was going to. And I believe Jesus kept it a secret from him and the rest of his disciples so that the dinner would not be interrupted. Tradition holds that this, 
this house that they went to was actually Mark's parents' home, and the man carrying the water was, was Mark's dad. And, and this, this particular house in the upper room would, would be the one in Jerusalem where the disciples would meet for prayer and where Jesus would appear to them later. But then in verse 15, he will take you upstairs to a large room that's already set up. And this is where you should prepare our meal. Jesus took care of the disciples. He had arranged the place ahead of time. Uh, he, had, he had worked out the details with the owner, but the disciples still had responsibilities. The room was set up. The disciples had to prepare the meal, and that involved getting the lamb. It had pick, been picked out a few days before, but now they had to take the lamb, take it to the temple, have it sacrificed, have the blood shed on the altar. Then they had to take it back, and they had to roast it, uh, and there was a whole process for it, and prepare the rest of the meal. Side note, we call this the Last Supper. The next time Jesus would see his disciples and have a meal with them, it was breakfast on the Sea of Galilee. And it's described in John 21, 12. Jesus says, come, let us get breakfast. Uh, I'm bringing that up because breakfast is the best meal of the day. But uh, it's just fascinating that the amount of time that food was involved when Jesus interacted with his disciples. But Jesus, uh, in verse 16, it says, The two disciples went into the city, found everything just as Jesus had said. They prepared the Passover meal there. Jesus' words came true. Jesus' words can be trusted. The master of the house, these two disciples, they had responsive hearts. You see, they had put themselves in position uh, at, at Jesus' disposal. They said, I, whatever you need, Jesus, we're here to do for you. Is that the position of our heart? Do, do we give Jesus instant, ready access to every room in our lives? These men, that was the case. In verse 17, Jesus shows up. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. This is going to be the last authorized Passover meal. 1,500 years of meals were concluded on this night 2,000 years ago. You see, the old Passover meal, it looked at Israel's deliverance from Egypt, and it was something to be celebrated. But what Jesus does in the rest of, of, of the passage we're going to look at today is he institutes a new system. This, this old system of ceremonies, of sacrifices and rituals comes to an end on this night. That's huge, ladies and gentlemen. History completely changed on this night. Jesus launched a new system, a new ritual, based on his blood, based on his broken body. And it's something that we call the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. Uh, it's also called communion. Some, some, some folks call it the Eucharist, which is just this, a word for giving thanks. So before we can see what the new and first supper are like, Jesus throws them a curveball. So they get there and they're celebrating, right? We see a surprise starting in verse 18. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. And then in verse 20, Jesus says, it's one of you 12 who's eating from this bowl with me. This was probably one of the most shocking statements Jesus could have made. Right? In, in Middle Eastern culture, betraying a friend after eating a meal with them was, and actually still is to this day, regarded as one of the worst kinds of treachery. And that's because eating with someone was, was evidence of peace, of trust, of, of forgiveness, of, of, of brotherhood. And, and in the Old Testament, David is, is, is betrayed by, by one of his friends, and he, he writes Psalm 41 as a lament to that. And he says this in verse 9, that even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. Right? This, this idea of, of sharing a meal, of breaking bread, and then going out and stabbing your friend in the back, that was treachery. That was awful. And that would have completely caught them by surprise. Like, who in the world? And it causes them to respond in verse 19. To, they were greatly distressed. There was something in their soul that, that was disturbed. And each one of them asked, am I the one? Am I the one? Am I the one? You see, Judas had already decided to be betray Jesus. And Judas is here at this meal. He partook of the fellowship meal knowing what was going to happen. And it's easy for us to jump on the Judas' evil bandwagon because his betrayal was atrocious. But let me ask you, if you profess to be a Christian, if you profess to follow Christ with your life and you end up denying him with the way that you live your life, 
that's betrayal as well. If you disobey, distrust, if you reject Christ's authority in your life, that's betrayal. If you've partook of the meal, if you've enjoyed Christian fellowship and then deny him with the way you live, with the way you speak, with the way you act, it's betrayal. It's betrayal. So do your words and do your actions match? It led these disciples to do some serious soul searching. If you remember, they used to have all of these arguments about who is the greatest. Lord, am I going to be the greatest in your kingdom? Let me sit at your right and your left hand. And now they're, they're talking about who's the worst among them. Who's the worst among them? Verse 21 says that, For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It will be far better for that man if he had never been, or, been born. Judas chose to betray God. God knew it was going to happen. So once the surprise betrayal bombshell was dropped, Jesus continues the meal. And, and the surprises continue as well. He took the traditional Passover meal and infused it with the liberating message of the cross. And we're going to see that in these verses. But, but what, what I want you to know is when we talk about the Lord's Supper, we need to think in four directions. Let me explain. We need to, to look back. We need to look at history behind us, right? To, to the Passover meal that was celebrated, but also to this particular night to when Jesus sacrificed his life. You see, Jesus would go on the very next day and, and would give up his life as a ransom for many. He would pay the price for our sins on the cross. So we look back to that and we celebrate that and, and we thank God for that. But we also look forward Right? This Lord's Supper communion, it's going to continue until Christ returns. So every time we partake of this, not only are we joining with the, the saints of old, but we are joining with the saints of the future. So we look in those two directions, backwards and forwards, but then we also look inward. Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he talks about the Lord's Supper, he says, we must examine ourselves before we partake. And this idea of examining ourselves means we look for any hidden sin in our life and confess it if we need to. We, we look for broken relationships and, and we make repentance and restoration and reconciliation whenever possible. So we examine ourselves so, so that when we partake, we, we can enjoy it. Then we also have to look outward because in, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul, Paul also says, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming His death until He returns. Who are we proclaiming that death to? Those who don't believe to other people. So we look backwards, we look forwards, we look inward, and we look, we, we look outward. And we, what we are going to see in these verses, we're going to see vivid reminders of the sacrifice Jesus made for his church. And, and it should be continual reminders of our calling to follow sacrificially in Jesus' footsteps in every area of life. So we're going to talk about the bread, the wine, and the, the music. In verse 22, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. He broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. This would be the unleavened bread and, and oftentimes unleavened bread was used to symbolize sin, idolatry and worldliness. But here Jesus changes that, that symbolism and, and it came to represent his body, represent the whole person because Jesus would bear on his body the weight of sin, idolatry and worldliness. So that's why he could become the bread. And notice he says that, that you should take the bread. If you were to take something, it means that you're not forced to take it, but it's something that you receive. And it's the same with the free gift of, of grace and, and faith through Christ. It's something we receive. It's a gift that we, we can't earn salvation. We can't earn the forgiveness of God. Jesus did that on the cross. We just take it. We just we receive it. Praise God. And then he says, take and eat. I don't know about you, but... Food's kind of vital for life, isn't it? We can't go for very long without food, without some sort of sustenance. So this idea of, of Jesus' body being broken, of, of it being given to us, and we are to take and we are to eat, it's vital for us. And when Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body. 
that was not in the Passover meal. That was not scripted. That's not what the host is supposed to say. You see, whoever hosted the Passover meal had a, had a particular script they were supposed to follow, and, and the host would explain the meaning behind each one of the, the parts of the meal. And here, when Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body, that's different. That's new. It's shocking. But the shock continues when he says in verses 23, and he took a cup of wine. This would have been the third cup, the cup of thanksgiving. And he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. So Jesus says, here, drink some of this. So, so they're, they're drinking what they think is the traditional third cup of the supper, of the meal. But then he says this in verse 24. After they drank it, he said to them, this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice for many. Jews had an aversion to blood. They didn't consume it. It was commanded in Genesis, don't ever consume the blood because it's the life source of that particular animal. And they especially would never even think about drinking human blood. And this would have caught the first century Jew off guard. Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. The imagery, though, is fascinating. In Hebrews 9, it says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. So and the, the sacrifices of animals would, it would, would be, they, they would take the blood and sprinkle it on the altar, and that would purify them from their sins. Well, here, Jesus is saying, no, my blood is the blood of the new covenant. Hebrews 9, 22 ends with, For the, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Jesus here is instituting a new covenant based on the shed blood of Jesus, and that secures salvation for those who believe. It says that, that it was poured out as a sacrifice for many. And what I love about this is only God can institute a new covenant. This covenant had been in place for 1,500 years, and God, through Jesus Christ, the God-man, instituted a new covenant. And this was a covenant that man cannot change. There were two types of covenants, one that was instituted by God that nobody could change, and then there was covenants between people in which either party could change and modify it. This particular one was one instituted by God that could not be changed, and here it is being changed. The statement that, that Jesus is saying, my blood is the new covenant, would have shocked the first century Jew. We kind of skim over it today, but it, it, would, have, it would have blown their minds. And here is a covenant that's being instituted that man cannot alter. We just accept it or we reject it. And Jesus says, my blood is going to be shed. It's going to be poured out as a sacrifice for many. Jesus shed his blood for you. You just have to accept it. Don't reject it. Accept it. Believe it. Jesus rarely speaks of his death, though, without looking beyond it. In verse 25, he looks to the end of, uh, end of days when he says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. In Revelation 19, there's a picture of the, the wedding feast of the lamb where, where the lamb, the, the Passover lamb, Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, comes back and he drinks wine at a, at a meal, at a wedding banquet. And this is the fourth cup Jesus is going to drink. In the future. So he's looking ahead to the marriage supper. He's, he's looking ahead to the end of times and saying, Look, during this particular time, we're, we're, we've got the Lord's Supper. You have my supper. And then in verse 26, we see the music. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. This was a reference to Psalm 113 to 118. They would sing. Psalm 113 and 114 be, be, before the meal, and then 115 to 118 after the meal. And you and I, we, we're so familiar with the person and work of Jesus Christ. When was the last time you thought of Jesus singing? We don't think of, we think of David singing because he wrote the Psalms, right? But when, when was the last time we thought of Jesus singing? I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure Jesus sang with hands lifted high. That he would have lifted his whole heart and being up to God, up, uh, in praise to God. And what's fascinating is Jesus is leading worship for his disciples. One of them is about to betray him. 
And Jesus is about to go to the cross. He is about to suffer immeasurable human pain, and he's singing the night before. All you worship pastors out there should be encouraged because I know it's not easy every Sunday morning to get up and lead and worship, especially if you've had a rough week. Jesus is on his way to the cross to die, and he's leading in worship. So the Last Supper is ended. The first supper was instituted. The disciples would be talking about this evening for the rest of their lives. And I want you to put yourself in their shoes, right? You, you had shared many meals with Jesus. Three years you had walked with Christ. And, and, and you had shared some Passover meals in the past with him. But there was something different about this one. There was something holy about this one. Jesus didn't even finish the meal, but he gave new direction. He took a 1,500-year-old tradition, ended it, and instituted the First Supper. And the church would continue this new tradition, celebrating the new covenant with God until Christ returns. And that brings us to today. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here in a minute. Uh, but before we do, I want to provide you with one takeaway and one action. First of all, the Lord's Supper works for good. The Lord's Supper works for good. It reminds us who we are. It reminds us what our story is, what our values are, and who claims us as his own. In the Lord's Supper, the gospel confronts all five of our physical senses because in, in, in the Lord's Supper, we see, we hear, we taste, we smell, and touch what it meant for Christ to die for us. It also binds us to the past, present, and future. We look back to Jesus' Last Supper and experience the beginning of a new covenant with God. We experience Jesus' death for us and the power of our sins being forgiven in the present. And we look forward to the future celebration in God's kingdom when, when everyone will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. The Lord's Supper works for good. Amen? So what I want you to do, how you apply this to your life, is I want you to renew your dedication to the Lord. Renew your dedication to the Lord. Wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, if, if you are running with God and you're on fire, stop and renew your dedication to the Lord and then keep running. If it's been a while since, since you've been uh, in a church or you've been around Christian community, that's okay. Time to renew your dedication to the Lord. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, today's your day. Start your dedication to the Lord today. Andrew Murray said this, Let everyone examine his heart. Believer, the observance of the Lord's Supper is a glorious opportunity of renewed dedication to your Lord. Let the Holy Spirit discover you, uh, to you what it is to be a decided Christian, to be undivided, to be unceasingly surrendered to Jesus in heart, hands, and lips, whether you're at home or in society. Live for Jesus. Work zealously for Jesus. Be a burnt offering that's given entirely for God. Be consumed by the fire of the Spirit. And in this Spirit, prepare yourself to be willingly bound to the horns of the altar. Renew your dedication to the Lord wherever you're at in your spiritual journey. Today's a new day. So I'd like to partake of the Lord's Supper and I often read from 1 Corinthians 11, so if you have a chance, turn over to there. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night he was betrayed, let me explain first of all what we're going to do. If you've got bread and juice, we're going to take of the bread first, and then we're going to partake of, of the juice after. Um, and there's lots of different churches that have lots of different ways of doing this. Um, if you uh, were here in person with us, I, I, would, I would explain to you that at Freedom Church, we, we practice something called open communion, which means you don't need to be a partner or a member of Freedom Church to partake. And uh, since I have no idea who's watching, that's, that's okay. Um, but we do ask that as we, we take the bread and juice together, uh, that you 
that you are a believer in Christ. So when I, when I said wherever you are in your spiritual journey, um, today's a new day. If you have never trusted Christ, all you have to do is cry out to him, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me, I believe. And then you can partake with us. You can eat with us. And, and even though this, this was a whole meal um, back in the day, and, and, and I encourage you to, to, in, to oftentimes when you sit down with other believers, when you sit down with people, take communion. It's okay to have communion every day. I know of people who do communion every morning as a couple. I know people who do communion every night as a family. Right? The Bible just says as often as, as you eat, as often as you gather, whenever, yeah. So on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So that's the first supper. That's communion where we commune with God we commune with others that's the Eucharist where we give thanks to God for forgiving us we give thanks to God for his blessings but it's in remembrance of Jesus Christ this isn't a shallow hollow empty ritual that we do this has significant meaning for the believer in Jesus Christ don't lose sight of that let's pray Lord we love you we praise you we are so honored and humbled to be part of your church, to be able to join with the saints of old and the saints of the future in celebrating the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he didn't do that without purpose. The purpose was for the forgiveness of sins, for the privilege of being an obedient child so Lord uh, today may we never forget that may we never lose sight of that may we renew our dedication to you in Jesus name amen